going to continue answering the question that we started into last week, and that is, uh, what will the new earth be like? And then uh, I'm going to start into the next question of what the new Jerusalem will be like. And that question, the, the second question, will take several weeks uh, because we're going to basically walk through verse by verse the last couple of chapters of Revelation where it gives us a, a vivid description of the new Jerusalem. Uh, so if you have an outline, or I'm down here on page 78 near the bottom on point C. What features will be found on the new earth? So last time, just by slight, quickly to recap, we talked about how the new earth is uh, new, meaning that it's similar but different. It's you know new and improved, if you want to uh, put it that way. It's also called, uh, the, the old earth is called the first earth, so that means the new earth is the second earth, which means there's continuity between the two of them. They're, they're both called earth, so they're, a lot of the things that we see on earth today will be on the new earth. Uh, when we get there, it'll just be you know, greatly enhanced and without sin. And that's some of the things that I want to talk about here this morning. Uh, I would say from reading in the scripture that there will likely be mountains, plains, bodies of water, trees, plants, flowers, animals, breathtaking landscapes, and many other beautiful things that this current earth possesses. Uh, because remember, it is a restoration and a glorification of the original creation and um, all of those things were in that. Uh, but I'll just give you a few things here that, that are specifically said to be on the new earth. Uh, the first one would be mountains, or at least a mountain is mentioned here in Isaiah 11 and verse 9. This is one of those probably three or four passages in Isaiah that depict the new earth. And it says there in Isaiah 11 and verse 9, uh, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So, um, there's a holy mountain there in the new earth. And these beasts that are going to be there uh, won't hurt and destroy like they do here. Now, there's going to be no death and destruction there. And I, I doubt that there's only going to be one mountain on the new earth. There's probably going to be uh, many of them. Uh, I think it was the, the passage that we read this morning, if I remember right, that I would look to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. So the Lord is uh, many times in Scripture referred to as being in the mountains, uh, the sides of the north, right? So the Lord likes mountains. It's pretty obvious. Uh, so I, I, I imagine we're going to have some beautiful mountains there. Uh, then there's also going to be highways, or at least a highway, uh, in Isaiah 35 and verse 8. Isaiah 35 and verse 8. Another passage um, talking about the new heaven and earth. Uh, it says, And an highway shall be there. And a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. Uh, the lion, no lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And a lot of the things that are mentioned there are also mentioned in the book of Revelation when it talks about no sadness and sorrow and crying and tears and things like that. Uh, so there's a way there, a highway. And there, the, it talks about the New Jerusalem having streets, right? So there are streets and highways uh, on the new earth. Uh, and then there's a city. There's probably going to be more than one, but there's definitely one big one, and we'll be talking about that later on today in Isaiah 65, 18 through 19. Now, this city is not going to be like modern-day American cities that are full of crackheads and drug dealers and prostitutes and human feces and tent cities. And <laughs> If you think I'm exaggerating, just look up some pictures of L.A. and San Francisco and other major American cities, uh, some on the East Coast as well. 
Uh, yeah, it's not going to be like that, thankfully. Uh, Isaiah 65, 18 through 19. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. So he's talking about the new heavens and earth there in verse 17. And he creates Jerusalem, which of course we're going to spend, like I said, weeks talking about. So there's at least one city there. Uh, but, you know, remember the parable of the pounds and the talents? And he says, have thou rule over ten cities and five cities. And So there's going to be more than one city on the new earth. There's going to be you know, lots of cities uh, outside of the big capital city, Jerusalem. Uh, there will be houses there. I know a lot of this is probably review. We've already probably touched on all these things. Uh, Isaiah 65:21. It says, and they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. So we'll have houses and vineyards, and if we have vineyards, then we can assume there will be soil and water and light, because vineyards don't grow without those things. So that's, I realize these are all kind of obvious things, but I just like to reason out as many things as I can uh, about it. And if there are vineyards, then there will likely be other vegetation as well. I, I don't think we're going to have a, a diet solely of grapes and raisins and wine. So, you know, chances are if there are vineyards, there are going to be all kinds of other vegetation and, uh, you know, beautiful trees and shrubs and flowers and vegetables and fruits and all the things that we enjoy here now, only a lot better. Uh, there will be animals there. We've talked about that already. Isaiah 65 and verse 25. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. So animals there that are all going to live harmoniously. They're not going to be carnivores, as we've mentioned before. And uh, and the other passage there in Isaiah, it said that the little child should play on the asp, on the hole of the asp, and so even even animals now that are dangerous that you wouldn't want to be close to there, you could have them for pets. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, that all sounds pretty interesting. It would be neat to be able to, once the, the curse is rolled back, and just to be able to walk up to deer or bears or any any animals and pet them and play with them. Because remember, Prior to Noah coming off the ark, the animals weren't afraid of men. Um, it said there, when Noah got off the ark, that the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast. But prior to that, they weren't afraid. They, they came right up into the ark and walked in there and lived with Noah for, I mean, every animal on the face of the earth, every, every breathing animal anyway, uh, lived right there in perfect harmony with Noah. Uh, so it'll, it'll be like that again which would be you know, pretty interesting. The whole world would be like a giant petting zoo so, with all these amazing animals. And then rivers, or at least a river, uh, in Revelation 22 and verse 1. If you think about it, what would the new earth be without mountains and rivers. I mean, it's pretty boring. It'd be a pretty boring earth if you didn't have mountains and rivers, lakes, you know, streams, things like that. Um, you know, if it was just all, I mean, if the new earth was just Kansas, <laughs> Illinois, places like that, it'd be a pretty sad place, wouldn't it? Uh, Revelation 22 and verse 1. But even Kansas and Illinois have little wee hills. Uh, there are a few. I always joke when we drive home and we drive through a certain part in southern Illinois, and I, talk, I, I say this is the Himalayas of Illinois, and they're like, probably like 30 feet high or something like that. But there are a few hills even over there in that godforsaken land. Uh, I, don't, I don't care much for Illinois if you haven't figured that out yet. 
uh, Isaiah, or, sorry, uh, Revelation 22 and verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So here is a river, and I think we could probably conclude there's going to be more than one, but this this uh, is a particularly special river because it comes right out of the throne of God. Uh, and, and you might wonder, like, well, how can it proceed out of the throne of God? And I was thinking about that, and there's a river that you guys go to when you camp, and it just comes right out of the right out of the earth, right <laughs> from the from the groundwater. So it could be like that, the throne of God, and this giant river just or whatever, however big it is, comes right out uh, from it, uh, which would be pretty neat. And if there are rivers, then there will likely be oceans or at least large lakes uh, for it to flow into, because rivers go somewhere, right? So I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, so prob probably will be at least large lakes there. If some of you more astute Bible students are saying, but wait, it says there will be no more sea. I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute. And if there are rivers and oceans, then there will likely be fish and other sea creatures in them, just like the original creation. Uh, there are, I've been told, there are a lot more species of creatures under the water on this earth than there are above the water, uh, just teeming thousands and millions of them. Uh, it's it's fascinating all that's down there, so we could probably get to explore some of that as well. Hopefully not in uh, that vessel that went to explore the Titanic last week. Um, yeah, what a shame. Well, they made it out to be just just a bit of a side note, right? They because of all the Biden revelations and everything. I mean, this is the speculation anyway. They, they made it out like this this vessel's been lost and, and they're going to look for it and blah, blah, blah. And like they only have, you know, four days worth of oxygen and we got to find them quickly. And yet they knew on Sunday night, shortly after the thing descended, that they have probes in the water to listen so they can hear if, you know, submarines and things are coming and for national defense. And they heard the thing implode. They knew it was it was toast, you know, and they it was just a big media hype to, to keep the keep people off of what the Bidens are up to. But anyway, I was kind of relieved to hear that, though, because I was thinking about those poor people in that vessel, and I thought, how awful would that be to suffocate to death? And I'm sure people would be down there just going nuts. Like, you know, you can imagine being trapped in a thing like that and realizing you're going to die. And, oh, I mean, it would just be a hor like hell on earth or hell under the earth or whatever. And when I heard that, that it just it imploded and that they would have just been basically incinerated immediately and they didn't even suffer. You know, it was a kind of a relief, honestly, for them. But So anyway, there's some other interesting stuff about that story, but that's not, not necessary for a sermon in church. Uh, so anyway, where was I? Uh, a couple of more things. There are going to be trees uh, on the new earth. Revelation 22 and verse 2. It says, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Of course, this is just speaking of the tree of life, um, or I guess two trees here, right? In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, there was the tree of life. So I assume on you know maybe both sides of the river. Anyway, whatever. Uh, this is a tree or trees, but there's probably going to be many, many trees, uh, just like there was on the original earth and there is on this earth. And fruits. These, this, these trees, these particular ones, bear these fruits, which are for the healing of the nations. Now, I mentioned about there being at least large, some large body of water on the new earth because you have the, the river that flows out of New Jerusalem, and it presumably goes somewhere, empties somewhere. Uh, so that would bring up the question, though, what about Revelation 21 and verse 1, which says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So there was no more sea. Does that mean that on the new earth there won't be any any 
oceans or bodies of water. A sea is the continuous body of salt water that covers the greater part of the Earth's surface. So primarily, number one, the sea refers to the oceans, saltwater oceans. So this could mean that there are no saltwater oceans on the new Earth. That, that could be what this is referring to. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily demand that there will be no bodies of water on the new Earth, and I'll give the reasons for that. Uh, first of all, seas were a part of the original creation. If you turn back to Genesis 1, 9 through 10, you see here that the Lord made the seas, plural, and as I will get to in a minute, the oceans that we have today weren't, the, the, the original creation probably didn't include these vast oceans that we have today, and I'll talk about where they came from and when here in a minute. Uh, Genesis 1, 9 through 10 it says, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. Seas. So there was more than one. There wasn't you know, just one giant sea, one giant ocean, but you know, many seas. He gathered waters together different places on the earth, and you had lakes and things like that. Now remember, the new earth is a restoration and a glorification of the original creation. So if the original creation had seas in it, then it would stand to reason the new earth probably has seas, some, some type of body is of water on it anyway. Uh, like I said uh, a minute ago, the vast saltwater oceans that we have today were likely not part of the original creation. You can turn over to Genesis chapter 7. Uh, they were most likely the result of the flood. Uh, Genesis 7, and verse 11. It says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. So when the earth was flooded, water came from two directions. It came from under the earth. The fountains of the great deep were broken up. So there was water underneath the earth that came up to the surface, probably in, with extreme velocity because there was you know, miles of earth's crust above it. And all that pressure, when it finally broke loose, likely water shot you know, way up into the upper atmosphere, froze, rained back down, covered the mammoths while they were still standing up, froze them in an instant to where the buttercups weren't even digested in their stomachs yet. Uh, and that's exactly what scientists have found when they examined the mammoths that are frozen standing up, and they cut right into them and went right into their stomach, and the food was not even rotten in their stomach. Like, they were frozen that fast, which would have to have been, at, you know, way, 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 way below zero. So anyway, that kind of explains, that that's called the hydroplate theory, by the way, uh, and that explains a lot of things that we see on this earth today, I think. Uh, so anyway, when the flood happened, the windows of heaven were open, so there was water coming from above and water coming from beneath, and it flooded the entire earth and covered the entire earth, even the mountains, and we probably didn't have, you know, the Himalayas and the Andes and and you know mountains that are 15,000 or 20,000, 30,000 almost feet high on the original earth. I think a lot of that probably happened as a result of the flood when the fountains of the great deep broke open and the plates of the earth started to move apart from each other and smash into each other and then that causes you know these giant mountain ranges to to push up and you can read Walt Brown's book called In the Beginning, Compelling Evidence for Creation and the Flood. If you're interested, you can read about the hydroplate theory. It explains a lot of that stuff. But anyway, most likely you didn't have Mount Everest on the original Earth, and the, and the water wouldn't have been 29,015 feet deep, right, covering Mount Everest, most likely. Uh, you had had lower mountains and the water covering all that. But anyway, let's go to verse, uh, verses 19 and 20. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills, 
that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. So, all this water that came on the earth, then, you know, it didn't, it didn't go back under the crust of the earth or something. So we probably had a lot, have a lot more water on the earth now than we did in the original creation. And as, you know, the continents all get smashed together and, and rise, then that's why everything's not underwater today because a lot of the, you know, the, the land had been pushed up. And so you have, you know, a relatively small amount of land now with these vast oceans in between, um, which, on the, on the old earth, I would guess that it was probably maybe the other way around. You probably had a vast amount of land with, you know, large lakes and things or smaller oceans or something. But, you know, all the water that was that came in to flood the earth probably wasn't obviously wasn't here in the original creation. So that probably means a lot more land and a lot less water in the original creation. If I just had to to uh, make an educated guess on that based on what I'm reading here. So it could be like that in the new earth. That's why it says there's no more sea, no more gigantic saltwater ocean anymore. But that doesn't mean that there is no, there are no bodies of water on the new earth. Seas can also refer to smaller bodies of water that is small and you know, relative to the ocean, but still huge. Um, and the Bible gives a couple of examples of these, like the Sea of Galilee, not exactly your average farm pond, but it's also not exactly the Pacific Ocean either. Uh, Matthew 15 and verse 29. I've never been to the Sea of Galilee, but just looking at it on the map, I, I doubt you can see across it, but I, don't, I guess I don't know that for a fact. But, you know, pretty, pretty good sized uh, body of water. And there are other uh, freshwater seas on this earth that are that are vast and huge as well. Uh, Matthew 15, verse 29. Probably don't even need to read this verse. but uh, And Jesus departed from thence and came nigh into the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. All right, so there's one body of water called a sea. And then back in the book of Joshua... Joshua 13 and verse 7, uh, 27, Joshua 13, 27, here's another sea. Uh, this is called the Sea of Chinnereth. Joshua 13, 27. And in the valley Betharam and Beth Nimrah, and Succoth and Zaphon, the rest of the kingdom of Sion, king of Heshbon, Jordan, and his border, even unto the edge of the Sea of Chinnereth, on the other side, Jordan, eastward. So here you have in the Bible at least two uh, bodies of water that are called seas, and they would be seas in this in the third sense of the word sea, which is a large lake or landlocked sheet of water, whether salt or fresh. Uh, this is um, specifically referring to an inland sea and in the proper names as the Sea of Galilee, uh, the Dead Sea, the Caspian Sea, and the Sea of Aral. That's according to the dictionary anyway. Now it's interesting if you remember from Revelation 21.1, it says there specifically there shall be no more sea, not seas. So I wonder from that if that's not, as I said, referring to, you know, this large ocean. I mean, we, we call them different oceans, but really there's only one ocean, right? They're all connected. I mean, it's all just one, one ocean, really, on the earth, one giant saltwater sea. Now, given that seas were part of the original creation, remember, and it says there in the plural, he, he the gathering of the water, Together, gathering together the water he called seas in Genesis 1.10. So given the fact that seas are part of the original creation, uh, that there were seas, that there are seas on the present heaven, and I'll give you verses for that in a second, and that there must be at least one large body of water 
for the river of life to flow into on the new earth, there must be large bodies of water on the new earth, I would conclude. Um, maybe not oceans, but large bodies of water. And, and we have examples, like I said there, uh, of seas in the present heaven. Uh, Revelation 4 and verse 6. Revelation 4 and verse 6. And before the throne was, uh, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So here is a sea of glass like unto crystal. You've probably all heard um, the crystal sea being spoken of, right? People talk about the crystal sea in heaven. That's what it's referring to there. Uh, probably because it's it's, it's referred to as glass and crystal because it's clear as glass and clear as crystal. And it's not exactly like the Missouri River, you know, a big mud hole. And then uh, Revelation 15 and verse 2. Here's another C, or maybe it's the same one. Uh, Revelation 15 and verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. You see, in heaven, Jesus isn't the only one that can walk on water, because these saints here are standing on the sea of glass. Um, you know, of course, by the, by the power of God. So, you know, given that fact, like I said, we got seas in the original creation, we've got seas up in heaven now, and we have an, a river that is proceeding out of the throne of God and running through the holy city, and it's probably going to empty out somewhere on the new earth, which would be a large body of water, like a lake or something. Um, I think it's reasonable to conclude that we're going to have at least smaller bodies of water on the new earth. Though, like I said, probably not these huge uh, saltwater oceans that we have today. Here's what Randy Alcorn had to say about that in his book on heaven on page 274 and 275. He said, even if this passage means literally no more ocean, he's referring to Revelation 21.1. Of course, this wouldn't require the absence of large bodies of water. Revelation tells us of a great river or tells us a great river flows right through the capital city, uh, chapter 22, verses 1 through 2. How much more water will there be outside the city? Flowing rivers go somewhere. We would expect lakes. Some of the world's largest, or some of the world's lakes are huge, sea-like. The new earth could have even larger lakes, especially if they have no oceans to flow into. Huge lakes could, in effect, be freshwater oceans. And you think about the Great Lakes. You ever been to the Great Lakes? Those things are massive. It would take you hours and, I mean, probably a good day at least to drive around. I mean, they're, they're gigantic. Uh, and when you go to one of those lakes, if you didn't know any better, if you didn't walk out in it and taste the water, any of you that have ever been to the ocean, you know when you go out there, I mean, you, you taste the salt, right, when you go swimming in the ocean. But if you didn't walk out in there and taste the water, if I just stood you on the beach of Lake Michigan or Lake Superior or any of the lakes, you'd, you wouldn't know that. There'd be no difference from that in an ocean. They'd look the same. I mean, they're just as vast, or they look as vast anyway from your standpoint. All right, and then just a little bit more about the new earth. Just one more very important point before we move on to the New Jerusalem, uh, and that is that the New Earth will not have the corruption of the Old Earth. There will be no more sin on the New Earth. Let's look at 2 Peter 3 and verse 13. 2 Peter 3, 13. Second Peter 3.13 Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So that's going to be 
a major defining characteristic which distinguishes the new earth from the old earth, and that is in the new earth there indwells righteousness. Um, unlike this sin-cursed place that we live in now. Uh, Revelation 21 and verse 8 tells us that there are not going to be any sinners in the new earth. Thank the Lord for that. And I'm not going to be one of them either. So I don't just thank the Lord there aren't going to be other sinners there. I thank the Lord that this sinner, like in his current sinful flesh, is not going to be there either. I will be renewed and not have this bondage of corruption on me anymore. Revelation 21 and verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So none of those types of folks are going to be on the new earth. Now, Revelation 22, 14 through 15. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, which is in the new Jerusalem on the new earth, and may enter in through the gates into the city, the new Jerusalem. For without are dogs, it's not talking about the four-legged kind, it's talking about the two-legged kind. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So those that do his commandments, the righteous are in the city without it. Like I don't know how I don't know how far the lake of fire is, but it's without the the city anyway, uh, without somewhere outside of the new earth, I presume. Uh, outside there are all these sinners. So we're not going to have to have our souls vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked any longer. And nor are you going to have your soul vexed with your own filthy conversation and your own filthy thoughts that you have to deal with now. There will be none of that, thank the Lord. The curse of sin will be removed. So not only won't there be sin, but there won't be the result of sin, which is the curse. That will be taken away. Uh, Revelation 22 and verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So no curse. Now that means, that that tells us more about the new earth. Because if there's no curse, that means that the ground will no longer be cursed and man will not have to work in sorrow. Because that was part of the curse as a result of sin. Revelation, uh, Genesis, pardon me, Genesis 3 and verse 17. This is, here's, here's the curse. That there is no more in the new earth. Here's, here's what this curse referred to. This is what the Lord uh, cursed Adam with after he had eaten the, the fruit in rebellion against God. Genesis 3.17 And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the, of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So that curse will be removed. The ground will be no longer cursed. Which means that the ground will no longer bring forth thorns and thistles. Because that was part of the curse. Verse 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So, nothing harmful that this earth has now will be on the new earth. Thorns and thistles. You could probably logically add to that poison ivy and poison oak and uh, you know any other uh, thing that could uh, that is harmful to us on this earth and man won't have to toil against the elements as he works verse 19 this is all part of the curse in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground for out of it wast thou taken for dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return so, no curse, no thorns, no thistles, and no working by the sweat of our face. We'll work, but it's not going to be this tedious, laborious, difficult work. We won't have, when we're trying to farm or garden, we're not going to have droughts and hailstorms and things like that that would destroy our crops. Um, 
it's going to be, as I've talked about in this series already, enjoyable, enjoyable work. And the creation will not groan and travail any longer, because this is also part of the curse. In uh, Romans 8, 20 through 22. No more painting, no more groaning, no more no more pain, I should say, no more groaning. No more groaning when you try to get up out of bed or when you squat down to get something and you stand back up. Um, none of that kind of stuff. No pains in your knees or your shoulders, your elbows or your backs. Romans eight twenty through twenty two. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not, uh, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. So, in that there is no more curse, there's going to be no more result of the curse. No more pain, sorrow, trouble, frustration, any of that. And then that brings us to the new Jerusalem. What will the new Jerusalem be like? And uh, like I said, this is going to take a while because there's a couple of chapters in the Bible that are devoted to this. And we're just we're basically going to walk through this and uh, glean everything we can. So first of all, if you turn to Revelation 21, uh, verses, verse 2 and verse 10, we see here that the New Jerusalem is called a holy city. Revelation 21 and verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then in verse 10, it says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So there are two places it's called the holy city. Holy means kept or regarded as inviolate, from ordinary use, and appropriated or set apart for religious use or observance, consecrated, dedicated, sacred. Conformed, it also means, uh, conformed to the will of God, entire, conformed to the will of God, entirely devoted to God, in earlier times often connoting the practice of asceticism and religious observances. Now usually it means morally and spiritually unstained, free from sinful affection, of godly character in life, sanctified, saintly, sinless. So that's a, that's a description of the holy city, morally and spiritually unstained, no sinners there, no corruption. It has people living in it that have godly character in life, saintly, sinless people. And the city is also entirely devoted to God, consecrated, it's sacred, Right? This is the place where God dwells, and we'll see that here in Revelation 21. So this is going to be a very different city from cities in the modern world. Uh, cities in the modern world could not be described in any way as holy. In fact, they are just big cesspools, and they somehow manage to draw in the worst of society, it seems like. And I don't know why that is. And I don't mean just in the inner cities. Yes, there's a lot of low lowlifes in the inner cities, but there's a lot of crazy people that are in the high rises and in the, you know, the penthouses and in, you know, the, the nice condo complexes and all that. Uh, it just draws, I'm sorry? Congress. Yes, well, that's another city that is exceedingly wicked, yes. It just, they draw, they draw lunatics for some reason. You know, Illinois, the state that I can't stand so much, just cut Chicago out of that and make it its own state, and Illinois would be a fine place to live. I mean, boring as can be, but...
but, you know, it'd be a fine place to live otherwise. Anybody that doesn't live in Chicago is probably a normal human being. But Chicago draws all the wackos, as do all the cities, for whatever reason. <coughs> Thomas Jefferson said cities would be the bane of our existence, and he was right. <laughs> Why do you think we have the insane politicians that people vote for, it's because of the cities. Take, take away the right to vote of people that live in an urban area and we would have, you know, like normal people probably running the country instead of these lizard people that we have today. But anyway. Now there will be nothing in the New Jerusalem which defiles or works abomination or makes a lie. Let's look at Revelation 21 and verse 27. Yes, I have my controversial theory of voting rights, and I think I just added another one to it. If you live in a place that has a greater population than 100,000, you shouldn't be able to vote either. Uh, so I, I would like to continue to limit the vote down to um, you know, people that, should be, that would be able to do so responsibly. But of course, my opinion doesn't matter anyway. It's not going to ever happen. Uh, Revelation 21 and verse 27. And there shall be in no wise, and there shall in no wise, pardon me, enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So nothing enters into this city that defiles, works abomination, or makes a lie. Which describes pretty much everything you see on TV everything you see in the media, um, the halls of government, especially at the high levels anyway, at the national level, um, all of this kind of wickedness that goes on all around us every day, oh, the universities, don't let me forget that, uh, the public school system, all this stuff we're not going to have on the new Jerusalem. You're not going to have wicked people teaching your children that there are over hundred genders or whatever and teaching them that they may be a boy they may be a girl it's hard to tell you can just you know choose whatever you want you're not going to have any of this wickedness that goes on today in the new jerusalem it should be very nice revelation 22 and verse 15 revelation 22 15 and without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So none of that. You're not going to have all this sexual sin. When you think he's, when he says they're dogs, you know what he's talking about? Most likely, sodomites. Thou shalt not bring the price of a dog uh, into the temple, the Lord uh, said back in the Old Testament. You're not going to have sodomites there. You're not going to have whoremongers. You're not going to have these people that are fornicating and shacking up together. You're not going to have sorcerers, seances and witches and witchcraft and all this kind of occultic stuff, idolaters. You're not going to have people worshiping other gods and stumps and statues. And, and you're not going to have people that love and make a lie. You're not going to have liars, and you're not going to have people that love to hear lies. And that's what this world's made up of, liars and people that love to hear lies. Only the holy, redeemed saints written in the book of life will inhabit the holy city. Revelation 21, uh, the second half of 27. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So it's only God's elect, blood-bought children that are going to be in this city. Uh, Revelation 22 and verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. How amazing would it be to live in a place, a city of all places, to live in a city where you could walk around at any time and never have to worry. When you see some guy walking towards you in the sidewalk, you don't have to cross the street and walk on the other side because you don't know if he's maybe going to knife you or something or rob you. And that happens. If I was in a major city, especially at night, and I was walking down the sidewalk, and I saw some guy walking toward me, walk to the other side of the street. 
I wouldn't walk by them. Not in a major city at night. You don't have to worry about that in the New Jerusalem. Number one, there is no night there. So you don't, you don't have to worry about that part. But you would never have to worry about coming across any wicked person in that city. That would be such a wonderful thing. I really look forward to that. New Jerusalem will come down from heaven and be placed on the new earth. Revelation 21, 1 through 2. See, New Jerusalem already exists. It's up in the present heaven now, and it will be brought down to the new earth uh, at the second coming of Christ after he destroys this earth. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That tells us, for one thing, that the New Jerusalem is beautiful. Right, a bride adorned for her husband. Right, that's usually when a woman probably looks her best on her wedding day when she's all uh, in a nice dress and uh, adorned very nicely. That's what the New Jerusalem is likened unto. So it comes down from heaven down to the earth. Uh, the city was prepared by God as a bride adorned for her husband, as we just read there in verse 2. The city is actually called the bride. It's called the Lamb's wife in verses 9 through 10. Revelation 21, 9 through 10. And, uh, and I hope to answer a question that maybe you've had before and you've wondered that it, it seems like the, the New Jerusalem is the church like it's referred to as the bride so is it actually a physical thing or is it just referring to the church just just all of god's elect and it is uh, a physical thing but it contains within it all the elect and so i, I hope to make some sense out of this here uh, in the next few minutes uh, so anyway verses 9 and 10 says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in, in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So he says, I'm going to show you the bride, the Lamb's wife, and then he sees the city coming down. So you might wonder, well, is the city just the bride of Christ? Is it not really an actual city? I think I have a pretty good answer for that here in a minute. So the bride of Christ is the church of all of God's elect for which Christ died. So let's just go back to Ephesians 5 and identify who this bride is that John saw. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And then if you compare that with chapter 1 and verse 4, we see there that this bride, the church that Christ died for, are the elect that God chose and gave to him. Ephesians 1, 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Which is uh, what it was said there of the bride of Christ there in verse 27, that he would present her a glorious church, not having spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So this is the elect. This is the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. Uh, in Hebrews 12, 22 through 23. Hebrews 12, 22 through 23. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the God and to God, the judge of all, in the spirits of just men, made perfect. So he tells them that they are come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. 
You see, so these two things, you see how they're intertwined and interconnected. The heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, and the church, the general assembly. That's all of God's elect throughout all time. Now notice that the heavenly city is currently filled with the spirits of just men made perfect. You notice that in verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the God and, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So as Paul's writing this, he's writing it, you know, in the first century, and it's still true today until the resurrection comes. This general assembly that assembles up there in the new Jerusalem, our spirits now, right? They will be, uh, they will receive their bodies at the resurrection. But now, they are spirits. After the resurrection, the new Jerusalem will be a dwelling place for the resurrected saints when it's placed on the new earth. Okay, so the city comes down from God out of heaven, and the saints are in it. And at that point, this is. They would be resurrected at that point because they're coming down to the new earth and this, this happens you know, after the final judgment on the last day at the resurrection. Now the city is called the Lamb's Wife because it's the dwelling place of the Lamb's Wife. And that's kind of how this all fits together. Why did he say, I'll show you the bride, the Lamb's Wife, and then he sees Holy Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem? Well, he calls... Um, Jerusalem by the Lamb's wife because it's the dwelling place of the Lamb's wife. And I was thinking about this, and I came up with an example in the scripture of this very thing. Uh, the church in Corinth was called Achaia because the region of Achaia was the dwelling place of the saints of that church. This will be our, our last verse for today. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 2. I was just thinking about this on Friday as I was reviewing this outline and added this point in, which I thought really cinched it up and, and gives, you, gives you another biblical example of a place being referred to by the people that dwell in it. Or vice versa. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 2. Paul says, For I know the forwardness of your mind for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. He's talking about this, uh, this collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem that he had written to the church in Corinth a year ago in 1 Corinthians, and he told them to lay by themselves on the first day of the week so there be no gathering when he comes, and so on. And he's talking about now that he had been boasting of this Corinthian church to the folks in Macedonia because they had, when he told them, they got ready and they got they, they put together uh, a bunch of money to send to these poor saints. But he says there, he boasts to Macedonia and he says that Achaia was ready a year ago. Now, Achaia is the region where the city of Corinth was. He's referring to the, to the Corinthian church by the region in which they live. It'd be like today if, if you know, we, we were all going to, the, the different churches were going to take up a collection um, for maybe some poor saints in some other church. And maybe some, you know, one of the pastors had, had organized this collection or something like that. And this other pastor says to his church, or he, he writes to another church, and he says, you know, I just want you to know that Excelsior was ready a year ago. Excelsior Springs was ready a year ago. We'd all understand exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about the Excelsior Springs Church. He's talking about the spiritual body here, but he could just refer to the church as Excelsior Springs because that's where the church resides and where the church meets, right? So it's the same thing with the New Jerusalem. That's why he can look at the New Jerusalem and call it the Bride of Christ because the Bride of Christ resides there, so he can call the city by the bride or you could call the bride by the city. It, you know, Either way, vice versa. It works both ways. So that, that kind of answered a question for me because I had always, you know, as I was reading there in Revelation 21, I'd wondered, like, is the, is the, is the church, actually, is, is, is the city actually just the church? And he's just referring to the church when he's talking about the city or not? And that really cleared it up. So it is an actual physical city and contained within it is the bride of Christ, the church that he died for, and therefore the city is called the bride uh, of the Lamb. So next week, we'll pick it up here again, talking about 
the New Jerusalem. And uh, we're just, like I said, going to step through Revelation uh, 21 and glean what we can from it. And I hope it's a blessing to you. Just a quick note at the end of the sermon. The most important thing a believer in Jesus Christ can do is to be a member of one of God's true churches. If you're not already a member of one, go to pastorwagner.com slash churches to see if there is a true church or other believers of like faith near you. That's pastorwagner.com slash churches.